In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Come Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who gives us the hearts of thy faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in that same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Today we're going to talk about the school of Alexandria and one of the greatest church fathers who ever lived, a man by the name of Origen. Um, in the last past couple of sessions we've been talking about controversies in Rome uh, and in North Africa in the Latin West. We're now going to move back east to the Greek-speaking part of the world, uh, where pretty much all of the theological action is really going to be for the next several centuries. All the major disputes arise and are centered in the Greek-speaking east. Uh, and in particular, in uh, this, the, the city of Alexandria is crucial to that. Alexandria is in Egypt. It was a new town founded by Alexander the Great when he conquered most of the world. He was from Macedonia. He brought his Greek-speaking uh, 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 troops and people into uh, most of the world, and as a result of the cities in the east all became Greek-speaking because of the Alexander's conquest. And he installed new pharaohs in Egypt. They were Macedonian Greeks, and the language of Egypt, uh, the official language at least, became Greek, uh, and had been for several centuries by the time we get to the time of around 200. Um, Alexandria was the second largest city in the world behind only Rome. Uh, the third largest was another city called Antioch, which had been founded by Alexander's general. So two was a new city, uh, a, a Greek-speaking city. It was in Syria. And as we'll see as we go forward, Alexandria and Antioch are the two principal cities in the east. And the bishops of those two cities become patriarchs, the Patriarch of Alexandria and the Patriarch of Antioch. And there will be theological disputes that will arise between those two great patriarchates uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, coming down uh, to, as we go through some more sessions. Um, both cities, interestingly, have a connection to St. Peter. St. Peter was the first bishop of Antioch in Syria. And tradition holds that the church in Alexandria was founded by a man named St. Mark, who was St. Peter's secretary. Uh, and wrote the gospel really as a, as a, as a, from Peter's point of view of the, the stories of the gospel. So both of them have a very close tie to St. Peter, as does, of course, Rome. And those three cities are basically the, going to be the most important uh, Christian cities uh, in the world for several centuries. Later, they'll become rivaled by a new, another new town called Constantinople, but that's not even existing at the time we're talking about. Um, Alexandria was much more important uh, than just for the church, though. Uh, it was, as I said, the second largest city in, in the empire. It was also by far the intellectual capital of the world. Uh, it had a great library, one of the greatest libraries that ever existed. It had a great museum with all kinds of things in it. And people, intellectuals, flocked there from all over the Greek and Latin world. If you wanted to be an intellectual and study uh, anything, the place to go was Alexandria. Uh, it was a huge city. It had an enormous Jewish population of displaced Jews who were now Greek speaking. Uh, uh, a couple of centuries before uh, the birth of Christ, uh, the, the Hebrew scriptures had been translated into Greek in the form of known as the Septuagint, the great Greek Bible, which then circulated throughout the world. And suddenly the Hebrew scriptures were opened up not only to Greek speaking Jews but Greek-speaking Gentiles and, and, and Latin-speaking Gentiles, too, because it, it, it circulated around the entire Mediterranean basin. Um, it was a center of pagan philosophy. At the times we were talking about, or in, the, in the early 200s, late, late 100s, um, there was a pagan philosophy uh, that developed uh, called Neoplatonism, Neo uh, and its earliest teacher was a man named uh, Ammonius Saccas, uh, who had a school in Alexandria. He taught Greek philosophy. One of his students was a man named Plotinus, whose writings basically are the foundation of Neoplatonic philosophy. He had a student named Porphyry, 
who was another important person. And Plotinus and Porphyry, their writings later influenced uh, such figures in the church as St. Augustine. Uh, he was in many ways a Neoplatonist, uh, and he, his Christianity, he, he took the Christian gospel and, and took what was the good, good that was in Neoplatonism and, and made it serve it serviceable for the church. Um, Porphyry uh, was an anti-Catholic, anti-Christian. Uh, uh, these people were all, uh, I'm talking about Plotinus and Porphyry and Ammonius Cyclus who were not Christian, uh, and Porphyry was hostile to the church. Nonetheless, in, throughout the Middle Ages, the uh, Catholic intellectuals uh, read Plotinus and in particular read Porphyry. Uh, Porphyry did writings to, uh, to explain Aristotle's works. Uh, he did a little work called the Isagoki, uh, which was used throughout the Middle Ages to teach Aristotle in Catholic uh, schools, Catholic seminaries. And to this very day in, in Catholic uh, universities, uh, Thomas Aquinas College, if you want to learn study Aristotle, the first thing they have you read is Porphyry's Isagogi. These are very important intellectual folks that are in Alexandria, uh, and it's hard to overstate the importance of this city uh, for the development of our culture and our history and, and, our, and, and the Catholic Church as well. Um, part of the what was going on intellectually in Alexandria is there was a school, the catechetical school of Alexandria was set up to teach the Catholic religion, to teach the Gospels. We're not sure when it was first set up because the records are lost, uh, but by, uh, we, we know that there was a man named Pantinus who was the uh, director of the school, and he had a student named Clement. Uh, Flavius Types Clemens uh, was a student of the Catechetical School of Alexandria, and when Pantinus died, Clement took over teaching at the school in about the year 180, and he taught at the school for the next 20 years. Uh, in the year 202, he had to flee because it was a persecution, and he fled to Cappadocia in Asia, in Asia, Asia Minor, present Turkey. And he left behind a young man, a young student, who took over on his own running a school. That young man's name was Origen. He's one of the greatest fathers in the history of the church. Um, and so, and the Origen uh, wound up teaching at the school uh, until the year 232. He taught for 30 years. And then he had a falling out with the Bishop of Alexandria. And as a result of that, he moved to Caesarea in Palestine on the coast there uh, and, and continued teaching there and doing his great works, his literary works and his and scriptural works, until he died uh, in the year 254. He, throughout his life, he would sort of embrace martyrdom and ultimately in the perse persecution of, under the Emperor Decius, he was tortured. And as a result of that torture, he died in 254. We talked about the Decian persecution in the last couple of classes. Uh, uh, pope, uh, several popes uh, uh, were, were martyred under the Decian pers persecution, uh, and it, it affected the world. But it, it, it also got Origen at the end. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Origen. Uh, on the handout, I've got more on the handout than I have on this chart here. The handout, the first thing is he, he led a life of severe asceticism. Um, and what do we mean by that? Well, let me just tell you a few things. Uh, he, his family was Christian, uh, and when he was a very young man, his father was in prison uh, and, and, and ultimately martyred uh, uh, as a Christian. Uh, Arjun tried to intervene in several ways. One thing, he would write letters to his father saying, hold fast to the faith, on account of us, don't. You know, go ahead and be martyred. It's better if you do that happen than you recant your Christianity. He also uh, sought to join his father in his martyrdom, and he was only prevented because his mother took away all of his clothes, and he was unable to go to be martyred with his father as a result of his mother's action. Um, he was, in many ways, a genius. Uh, as a young man, he studied. He studied. Uh, tradition tells us he studied under Ammonius Saccus the great Neoplatonic teacher in Alexandria, and he mastered all of Greek literature, history, philosophy. He, he understood the pagan culture and read all the Greeks and studied all the, uh, the works of Greek culture. Uh, he also was a voracious reader of scripture. He memorized large sections of scripture. He studied under Clement of Alexandria and ultimately took over the teaching of the Catechetical School in Alexandria. Uh, and continued to teach later in Caesarea when he left. Um, he, he had a life of severe asceticism. He uh, 
Uh, tradition tells us he, he always slept on the floor. Uh, he never ate meat or drank, drank wine. Uh, he stayed up most of the night uh, in scripture study. He, he, he didn't sleep hardly ever. Uh, and, and he did things, uh, all things like that. One of the things that, he, that, that Eusebius, the historian, tells us that he did uh, is, is sort of infamous in, in church history. I'll just read you Eusebius on this. Eusebius says in his church history, uh, about the same time, while responsible for the instruction at Alexandria, Origen did a thing that provided the fullest proof of a mind youthful and immature, but at the same time of faith and self-mastery. The saying, there are eunuchs who make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, he took in an absurdly liberal sense, and he was eager both to fulfill the Savior's words and at the same time to rule out any suspicion of vile reputations on the part of unbelievers. The, that saying is from Matthew 19, 12. There are eunuchs who make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Um, a lot of Catholic uh, scholars uh, and, and authors, G.K. Chesterton among them, says that that's a prophecy about the Franciscans and the, and the monastic orders and, and friars. Uh, or the immature of origin took it literally, uh, and, and, and that's another aspect of his severe asceticism. Um, he was a prolific writer. He, he was said to have written 6,000 volumes. Now, volumes in those days are not like our volumes. They'd be smaller. They would be scrolls. And a lot of people say that can't possibly be correct. It must be an exaggeration. But whatever the true number, it, it's, it's clear he wrote an enormous amount of of uh, text. He wrote works involving apologetics, textual criticism, scripture commentary, homilies, philosophical theology, and spirituality. Not, all, not many of these have come down to us. Uh, I'll talk about a few. In spirituality, uh, he has a short work on prayer, on the Lord's Prayer, uh, which is still read uh, by Catholics uh, with, 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 prop, with, with it's a great work. Uh, Pope uh, Benedict XVI talked about it in one of his allocutions uh, uh, on origin and his importance to the church. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about the, the things that he, let's talk about scriptural, scripture commentaries. He wrote commentaries on just about every single book in the Bible, uh, lengthy commentaries, uh, exploring uh, all aspects of these things. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, uh, in the first first part of John's St. John's Gospel, there's a phrase, in the beginning was the word, uh, in principio era verbum. Uh, in Greek, it's in, in archaean logos. On those four or five words, he wrote an entire book commenting on just that. And that's, that's the level of detail uh, he would go into on these things. Uh, most of these commentaries, unfortunately, have not survived. We still have good sections of his commentaries on the Gospel of St. Matthew and the Gospel of St. John. You can find these on the internet if you're interested in looking at them. He developed uh, a systematic way for commentating, comment, comment, doing commentary on, on uh, Scripture. Uh, and he had a threefold approach. He would study the literal meaning of the text and get that down. Then he would talk about the moral meaning. What, what does the text say for us as to how we should live? And then perhaps most importantly, he would, he would get into the spiritual or allegorical or mystical meaning of the text. And he, he really, allegory is a very famous thing that he was, is very famous for, the School of Alexandria is famous for it, and later on all of the, all of the bishops and scholars coming out of Alexandria, Alexandria tend to emphasize the allegorical meaning. And what he did, used that primarily for is he went through the Old Testament and brought out how almost every page of the Old Testament there are prefigurations of Christ. Uh, Christ is, when read properly, the Old Testament is full of allusions to, to our Lord and the coming of our Lord. Uh, and, and he was able to show how those things are there. And he did it for several reasons. One thing was, it was there had been, as, as we've talked about, the Martianites had said, well, the Old Testament is, is not... It is bad. That's the evil God. We've got the good God over here with the New Testament. The Old Testament has nothing to do uh, with our religion. And Origen said that's not true. The Old Testament is the foundation of it. Uh, the, the Gospels, the New Testament are the perfection of it. But the Old Testament is, is part of one continuous story. And it's a, it, the story really is a, the, the story of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, and he is responsible for making it very clear that the Bible, despite being made up of different books by different authors and different genres at different times, despite all that, it is one unified intellectual whole uh, coming from God. Uh, so he, he did that work in doing these scripture commentaries. Um, he also uh, did, he, he's famous for homilies. He practically invented the homily. Uh, he did, he, he wrote hundreds if not thousands of homilies. We, we, we have just a few of them uh, that exist. And he, he, he used these homilies to expound on his scripture commentary. Scripture commentaries were written at a very high intellectual level. The homilies are much more directed to just the, the ordinary person uh, at the service to, to, to bring out uh, the, the uh, truths of the gospel in the Old Testament. Um, you may have missed this, uh, uh, but in, on June the 12th, 2012, there was a big news story. Uh, the Vatican reports discovery of ancient documents. And what happened was uh, they found 29 lost homilies of origin. Uh, scholars found these things. Uh, and this wasn't like Indiana Jones, archaeologists and all. Where do you think they found the 29 homilies? In the Vatican Library. In a library, sure. <laughs> no, this was at the, uh, the State Library of Munich oh, in Bavaria, yes. State Library of Bavaria. And there was an old Byzantine books uh, that people hadn't been looking at much for a couple of centuries. <laughs> and somebody finally read them and said, by golly, here are 29 homilies of origin. Uh, so the, the whole uh, academic world that's into this kind of thing is very excited by this. It's a major find. Uh, but you never know what you'll find in the library. So uh, go out and read things and see if you can find it. Yeah, the other dedicate was found in a library. And, Codex Vaticanus was found in the library. They didn't know they had, you know, the oldest Bible. There's a lot of stuff in the back and nobody knows what it is. <laughs> and they, they may have the Ark of the Covenant. Who, who knows? <laughs> what's, what's, what's working there? Uh, uh, he wrote uh, apologetic works. One of them has survived called Contra Selsum. Selsum is a, 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 was a, a, a pagan a philosopher who wrote a very detailed refutation of Christianity and said Christian religion makes no sense, it's defective for the, all these reasons, and he gave all the reasons that have ever been given. And there, uh, Origen wrote a book, I think it's in eight books actually, refuting that step by step. It's one of the greatest apologetic books ever written, refuting all of the standard objections raised by the pagan world to Christianity. It's a very important book, and he still has it. Um, if that wasn't enough, he also worked, wrote something called the Hexapla. And the Hexapla is very, is crucial uh, to the development of the Bible that we have today. It was said to be 6,000 pages in 50 volumes. And it, it was in the, held in the library at Caesarea for many centuries. And what it was, it had six versions, six versions of the Old Testament in parallel columns. The first column was the Hebrew. He learned Hebrew. He talked to the Jews there, he got he was taught Hebrew, and he got a Hebrew Bible, and he put in one column the Hebrew text that he had. The next column, he put in word-for-word -word transliteration into Greek words, so you could read what these Hebrew words were in Greek all the way through. And then the next column, he had the Septuagint, the, the, the received translation in Greek of the, of the Hebrew Bible. He had that in that column. In the fourth column, he had another version of the uh, Old Testament that written in Greek by a man named Aquila. Uh, I'll skip over the fifth column for a minute. In the sixth column, he had a, yet another version of the Old Testament translated in Greek by a man named Theodosian. Uh, the fifth column was his column where he tried to, to reconcile or point out differences in all the other columns. And he used used little marks to indicate where there were words in the Greek that weren't didn't exist in the Hebrew versions, and where the different versions differed, and his views as to which versions were the best to get to the actual underlying text. Uh, where there was doubt, he had he had he had three more columns with three more versions where he would uh, put in a different uh, 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 make different notations about where there were changes and all. And he was doing this because he 
believed in scripture and he wanted to get the actual text. And in the ancient world, if you have manuscripts, they're hand copied by hand. There are lots of variations that creep in. Uh, there, there are omissions and duplications and, and different translations and things. And he wanted to get the best because he wanted to, to be able to give a, uh, the best kind of commentary on the scripture if possible, particularly to get to the literal meaning of the scripture. Uh, this stupendous work, uh, uh, it, it, it's just, it, it would be difficult with computers to do it today. Uh, and one of the things he had, that we don't have, he had all of these old ancient texts. Most of them had been lost, but he had access to earlier texts in the Septuagint and these other translations and the Hebrew uh, scripture. So his work is, is crucially important for the develop development of the our Bible and, and, and getting to what the actual text is. Um, the, it was so large, uh, 50, 50 books and 6,000 pages, that there was only one copy of the original and it stayed in the library of Caesarea until it disappeared in the 7th century with the Arab conquest. We have little fragments of it left. But before that happened, a man named St. Jerome was sent to Judea and went to Caesarea and lived in the library. And he used uh, the hexapla to do his translation, uh, the Vulcan, and so we have a lot of the benefit of that from St. Jerome's work. Um, wow. He wrote a, a lot of other theological things. One that has come down to us is called De Principiis. In Greek, it's Peri Archon. And the text that's come down to us is heavily corrupt. It's not in Greek. It was written in Latin by a man named Rufinus. It was translated. And Rufinus at the time was in a bitter dispute with Jerome. Uh, Jerome was a pretty disputa disputatious kind of guy. And Jerome was a great fan of Origen. Of course, he relied upon the Hexapla. And Rufinus came forth with his Latin translation of De Principiis and said, you know, Origen's not really theologically correct. He might be a heretic. And this guy Jerome is, you know, championing him. Well, Jerome took that as a, you know, a, 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 a challenge. And so, so they... They started writing back and up for the two brief letters seeing who hated origin the most. Uh -huh. uh, the, the Latin text has come down to us, and it's a, it's a, it's a not very good translation, and it's not clear what origin, what the original Greek said. So it's not clear to the extent that origin that says things that are heresies, that origin really espouses those things. It may have been him talking about what other people said, or it may have been just speculation. Um, but it does have things that are, are, are of interest to us. One is the, the upholding of Catholic tradition. Um, and, and I want to go back for a moment to his teacher. Uh, his teacher, uh, Clement of Alexandria. Let me see if I get this back here. Clement wrote several things that have come down to us. And one of them I thought that's interesting, he, he wrote a tract about who, who is the rich man that shall be saved? How can the rich be saved? It's a very interesting uh, little track. And in it, he describes his view, the view of the Church of Alexandria of St. Peter. Uh, and he says, this is Clement of Alexandria. He refers to Peter, the chosen, the preeminent, the first of the, the disciples, for whom alone and himself the Savior paid the tribute. Uh, and I've always thought that that was a very interesting thing. Part of the, uh, the, the, the Gospel of, uh, I think it's Matthew, refers to the, the, the scene where uh, Jesus is talking about tax with Peter and said, you think I'm subject to the tax? And Peter says, no, no, I don't think you're subject to the tax. And uh, Our Lord says, well, just so that we don't offend anybody, why don't you throw a fishing line in there and pull out a fish? He pulls out a fish, the fish costs up four drachma, and he says, okay, you can pay my tax and your tax with that. So the, the uh, and St. Peter, and we need to be reminded, St. Peter is the only person in history that God has personally intervened to pay his taxes. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I just find that astounding. And it's not, I, you don't hear about it enough, I think. You know, it's an astonishing thing. It actually happened. And uh, God intervenes, if God intervenes to pay your taxes, you can, you can move up to a higher place. <laughs> but anyway, uh, his, his beautiful origin, uh, he's insisting on the uh, tradition uh, in De Principiis, in the preface, he says the following. Although there are many who believe that they themselves hold to the teachings of Christ, 
There are yet some among them who think differently from their predecessors. In other words, they're not following what the earlier people taught. This is what he has to say about that. The teaching of the church has indeed been handed down through an order of succession from the apostles, apostles and bishops and bishops, and remains in the churches even to the present time. That alone is to be believed as the truth, which is in no way at variance with ecclesiastical and apostolic tradition. So he's a very strong defender of the tradition that the, that the gospel was entrusted by our Lord to the apostles and entrusted it to the successors, and it's to be guarded and preserved. Another thing he says is, is an early, what I, I would consider perhaps an early creed. He says, the sp specific points which are clearly handed down through the apostolic preaching are these. First, that there is one God who created and arranged all things and who, when nothing existed, called all things into existence. And that in the final period, this God, just as he had promised beforehand through the prophets, sent the Lord Jesus Christ, Secondly, that Jesus Christ himself, who came, was born of the Father before all creatures, and after he had ministered to the Father in the creation of all things, in other words, our Lord created everything, that's what he's saying here. For through him were all things made. In the final period, he emptied himself and was made man. Although he was God, it's not about our Lord, although he was God, he took flesh, and having been made man, he remained what he was, God. He took a botany, and on this, this uh, he yet again refutes the notion that, that is current in academic circles that Jesus was his wise preacher, and the idea that he was God was something that was imposed centuries later by the church, by the Pope, by the emperors to, to control the populace, and that that was a later thing, that Jesus was God. As we've seen, it's there from the very beginning. We talked about Ignatius and Clement and the others. Here's another example of it. He says, although he was God, he took flesh, flesh, and having been made man, he remained what he was, God. He took a body like our body, differing only in this, that it was born of a virgin and the Holy Spirit. Moreover, this Jesus Christ was truly born and truly suffered, and he endured this ordinary death, not in mere appearance, but did truly die. For he truly rose again from the dead, and after his resurrection, he conversed with his disciples and was taken up. Third, they handed it down, the apostles that the Holy Spirit is associated in honor and dignity with the Father and the Son. So that's a, that's a, a powerful statement from origin that's totally in, in accord with Catholic tradition. Um, origin, this, this book, De Principis, has problems in it uh, which, for which uh, origin was later condemned. Uh, there is mention of a belief in the pre-existence of souls uh, there, which is contrary to Catholic teaching. There is also a mention of uh, to uh, of universalism, a belief in universalism, uh, which comes out of Acts 3.21, where the Greek word is apokatastasis, apokatastasis. Uh, that section, uh, let me see, that part of Acts says, uh, Jesus Christ, whom heaven indeed must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, of the restoration of all things which God, God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets from the beginning of the world. That phrase has, has been used uh, uh, by religious thinkers to, to hope that there is a way that everything will be restored and that, that uh, there will be universal salvation at the end of time in some fashion. Even the devil uh, will be converted and everybody will, will, be, uh, will, will come into... To, uh, Harmony with God. That, of course, uh, has been condemned, and it's not, uh, it's not, uh, not the, the right teaching. Uh, hell exists, uh, and the gospel suggests that a whole lot of people are probably going to go there. Uh, but there's still, I think, this phrase is the justice of God demands that hell exists. Uh, the mercy of God allows us to help hope that not many people are there. Is how that's that's sort of his phrase. But anyway, he, he fell into tr trouble because De Principis has universalism in it. And then later, uh, there's something called Originism. There were followers of Origin who, in later centuries, who took the, some of his ideas that were not exactly orthodox and, and, and pushed them further than perhaps Origin had even, ever intended or, or even said. And originism was a problem in the next few centuries, and ultimately the Emperor Justinian, in 553, called the Fifth Ecumenical Council of uh, Constantinople II, 
And at that council, Arjun was condemned to anti-Arjunism as, as heresy. And as a result of that condemnation, Arjun is not a saint, uh, and, and he's not. He, and uh, and uh, for many centuries, he was he was sort of viewed as not not somebody that anybody should be associated with. In more recent times, uh, the Catholic Church uh, and, and certainly scholars have come around to the view of his importance, and he's got great value of, of his writings and his work uh, are tremendously valuable to the church. Uh, and as I said, the, our, our current Holy Father, he, he gives allocutions on the, on the early fathers. He, he devoted two sessions to origin and his importance and about how his many contributions to the church. And so in modern times, he's, he's, his reputation has risen uh, uh, considerably despite the condemnation at the, uh, centuries after the fact, in 553 at Second Constantinople. Um, I'd like to. Okay, um, can I ask yeah, a question sure. here? A little, clear, a little clarification about the um, universal self. I've heard that Origen, uh, on the one hand, people say, oh, he believed in universal salvation. Right. And then others will say, oh, no, maybe that was just a corruption of what he said. That's right. what somebody said he said. Right. So it's, what is what, what Well, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell because most of his works, a lot of his works we don't have. The only one we have that suggests that, I think, is De Principis, which is the Latin. Translation done by Rufinus, who is not real trustworthy because he may have altered it to further his feud with Saint Jerome. We can't tell how much that is. Uh, certainly, f later Origenists, his followers, some of the followers, espouse this more more directly. The, the truth is, nobody knows for sure what Origen believed or taught because the only things we have may be corrupted and may be distorted. It comes from the. Prince of PC, PCA. Principes, first principles. Very that article. was supposed to, it was written by Origen, but translated by Origen. Yeah, we don't, we don't have the Greek text, and, and nobody knows. One of the things is. He is the author of it, though, right? He, yes, and Rufinus yes. translated it into Latin. We don't know how good the text was because it was centuries after the fact, and we don't know what kind of acts <laughs> Rufinus had to grind. Uh -huh. uh, it, it, we found, you know, they found the homilies in the library. People are hoping that they'll find. Perry Archon, the Greek somewhere, and you can decide what it are. It may be that Origen said some people hold to this, mm -hmm. and it's nice to be merciful, but I don't. It is not clear what he actually said. But any anyway, he was condemned by an ecumenical council, so he's not a saint. But uh, Philip Hughes, Monsignor Philip Hughes, wrote in the forties a history of the church, and he is a very reliable Orthodox Catholic historian, a great man. And I want to close by reading what he says about Origen. In Scripture, besides a great mass of commentaries which covered every book of the Bible, he published that stupendous instrument of textual scholarship, the Hexapla. Here were set out in six parallel columns, four Greek versions and two Hebrew versions of the Old Testament, in an endeavor to ascertain the value of the Septuagint text. Then, as an apologist, he wrote the eight books against Celsus, <clears throat> the most perfect apologetic work of the primitive church in answer to the mightiest attack on Christianity that paganism ever produced. His theological reputation depends chiefly, however, on his Summa, the Book of Principles, uh, Periarchon. Here, for the first time, a Christian writer, with no preoccupation with controversy to influence the order of his work or his style, endeavors to explain systematically the whole body of the tradition. That the technical language of theological science was as yet too undeveloped to say nothing of the notion of theology as a science. It was too undeveloped to make success possible, does not detract from the glory of the pioneer. Faults and serious faults were in the circumstances inevitable. And the product of Origen's mighty erudition was, in the centuries that followed his death, to be more than once the occasion of controversies that aroused the whole church. Nor are Catholic scholars in one, even today, in their opinion of Orthod Origen's orthodoxy on many points. But of his genius, which places him near to St. Augustine himself, of his encyclopedic learning, of Origen's real holiness of life, and of his constancy in the presence of persecution, there has never been any question. In his own lifetime, for all the misunderstanding between himself and the Bishop of Alexandria, there was never any condemnation of his theories. He died venerated by all the Catholicism of his time. But almost from the moment of his death, discussions began, and presently from one quarter and another, condemnations began to shower upon his work, though never were any made of the man himself. 
And that sort of sums up the the uh, well, if he position was, of our day. If he was preaching universal salvation, surely some saint or someone would have jumped on that right away. And they jumped on every other heresy, and rightly so. Well, well could you say it got jumped on in 553. Well, that's all. I'm sure there were discussions about it, but exactly when... See, it's not clear what he preached. Well, what I'm saying is, if he, if he was preaching universal salvation at that time, somebody would have spoken up and said, no, that's not right. Don't you think? Could we, well be. You may not have a record. Could well be. Oh, yeah, I'm not okay. All right, I'll buy that. Yeah, yeah it, we have very little... So we don't... You know, it's not clear the extent to which he preached it, if he preached it at all. Well, I'll back up to If point. he said it at all, it may only be in one or two works. Uh, that may not have been... I don't know. It, 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 it's it, it, he was, as famous as he was, I mean, surely somebody that the Pope or somebody would have said something and we would have had some kind well, of Well, we're in the second century, we're in the third century, the 200s. Keep in mind the crisis of the third century. You know, there's an emperor gets murdered or killed every every uh, you know year, perhaps. The entire world is in chaos. Uh, there are persecutions breaking out. Uh, every few years that attempt to destroy the church. Uh, it's a wonder that we have any of the writings, frankly. Uh, we have very few. Uh, he wrote 6,000 volumes. We've got, you know, maybe maybe, maybe 50 or so. Uh, maybe a generation, maybe fewer than that. So the notion that there may have been writings. Well, when Tertullian got, got way off track, there was plenty of record of that and plenty of condemnation of that. Right. Uh, Origen had... Wouldn't the same thing happen? It happened almost about the same time period. Well, all I can say is there are no there, there are no records of documents that I know of on that uh, for a long time after his death, and it didn't it didn't really rise to to the fifth ecumenical council. We're going to cover that council, God willing, sometime in late spring, and, and it's a very interesting council. It was more it was one of the councils where the emperor Justinian was advancing a an agenda. Uh, at the at the uh, urging of his wife Theodora, uh, who, by the way, are both Orthodox saints, uh, they kidnapped the Pope, and they're very it's, they're all kinds of strange things about that council, uh, and we'll we'll talk about those, God willing, uh, eventually. So there'll be more records, but it'll be a couple of centuries now. But uh, any more questions? Uh, oh, because I talked about the hexable. Uh, and its importance for the development of the Bible and it relies upon it by St. Jerome. We're going to take a little detour. The next two classes, I'm going to talk about the Bible, the church fathers in the Bible. I'm going to talk about the Hebrew, Greek, and Latin Bibles, how they developed. I'm going to talk about St. Jerome, and I'm going to talk about how those Bibles, the development of those Bibles thereafter, up to the present day. Uh, so I'll talk about our current uh, Vulgate versions, the Clementine version, and where those come from, and how they relate ultimately to Origen and Jerome. So we're going to take a detour, uh, and we're going to go uh, some centuries ahead, but we're going to start here. Uh, but to give you a, 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 a coherent view of it, I think it's important to do that. I think it's useful, because I think we can all use a review of, of, of Scripture and how our Bible came to be. So next two classes will be a, a, a talking about the development of the Bible, with, with, starting with the original thought. Let's finish with a prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Hail Mary, full of grace and words with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.